Hello, I'm Benjamin Miss, and this is Physiological Psychology. Today, we will be discussing memory and how it works in the brain. Well, in order to start, we want to consider what should we be focusing on in this section? Well, what areas of the brain are associated with different types of long-term and working memory? So we're gonna be looking at the different types of memory. So memory we think of as kind of like this thing, right? We just have this memory. But from both a functional and neuroscience perspective, memory is a number of different things that are all under this umbrella. We'll also wanna look at the causes and mechanisms of amnesia and memory loss. In fact, a lot of these studies are what's gonna help us to understand how memory works. So, we start with an old story, right? The idea of the grandmother cell. This, this idea is that we have this, you know, um, we think about how concepts work, right? So we have these ideas like, all right, when we studied vision, we looked at how we've basically got these little photoreceptors that are coming up with pixels. And we need to somehow rebuild this world. And we do it by looking for these features for lines and then other components. And eventually you get, boom, here's a face, here's a tree, you know, here's a whatever it is that we're looking at. Well, we think of, okay, there's just like one cell at the top making that happen. But in terms of memory, it doesn't seem to be working quite that way. If we think about it, if you had like one cell that was accessed for, Okay, we've got all these features and it's a face and it's a person and boom, this cell is like, this is your grandmother, this is your grandmother and it's firing and it's like excited and that, when that cell fires excitedly, we're like, oh, that's, this is my grandmother. So that's the idea of the concept of the grandmother cell. You have this one cell where this memory is functionally stored, right? When all this information gets there, it's like, boom. Well, this isn't really what we, how memory works. Memory is spread out in the brain. But it's still complicated and it's still interesting because there was a study done, um, published in 05, on a single cell recording, right, in a particular human who had severe epilepsy and was having surgery. So sometimes, and these, these are very uh, valuable patients, like researchers like get excited, they like all want to study these people because you're able to put neural nets directly onto the brain. So a lot of these patients are getting surgery for like severe, severe epilepsy or, or something else in their brain. And so part of their skull is going to be open for a length of time and they stick a neural net on there to kind of record the, what, what's happening. Well, when you do this, you're able to really get in and look at specific cells in the brain. In this case, they had a single unit put in very deep in their brain, in their memory area. So this patient was participating between seizures. And here's the location of where it was from the study. You have this very deep uh, location here, right around their hippocampus. Okay, so the question is, what is this cell doing? Well, they tested a bunch of different things. And what they found was this cell absolutely loved Jennifer Aniston. When this, when they showed pictures of other celebrities with similar hair, other things, this cell went nuts. Like it was most excited for specifically Jennifer Aniston. And it's funny because it kind of, you know, we're like, yeah, yeah, this, there's not a grandmother cell. There's not a Jennifer Anderson, Aniston cell, but it doesn't mean that we don't have cells that do get excited about various things, right? So I'm sure there would be other things a cell would get excited about. It just didn't have a chance to, to study every possible stimuli combination to see what was going on. And you'll notice this cell is also a jealous cell because you see these pictures of, you know, Jennifer Aniston with Brad Pitt and uh, this cell is, is not happy. So it's really interesting how, how memory is, is stored. And the general idea is that it's stored kind of spread out. So when we ask, well, can we locate learning in the brain? The answer is, well, yes. However, it's definitely complicated. The easiest way to look at this is through types of conditioning, right? And so you've got classical and instrumental or what's called operant conditioning. And so the simplest way to look at learning, especially in non-humans, is classical conditioning, because you should see, okay, here's a before and here's an after. Okay, so, you know, you ring the bell, the dog salivates, the bell is then associated. There should be some kind of connection, as Pavlov suggested, between the 
uh, conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Because now if a bell is causing salivation, just like food used to, there should be some kind of connection in the brain between bell and food that is now creating this. So this is Pavlov's idea. It's a perfectly reasonable and logical idea. And Lashley, Carl Lashley, one of the, the you know, um, early uh, pioneers in memory, looked for what they call the engram. Now, the engram is kind of seen as like the scientific term where, you know, or, or, or now it's become like a sci-fi term, you know, where you have like this memory stored in the brain. All right. And so it's kind of like, well, is this, is there something actually there? You know, is there some kind of, you know, um, of memory in some way? Right. Well, Lashley believed that if this was the case, you should be able to cut out this engram you should be able to make a cut through the brain that would disconnect this connection between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus therefore boom showing that that pavlov was correct well lashley sliced and diced through the rat brain all right all over the place lashley was basically just like you know looking for this engram and couldn't find it. All he got was rats that were just really slow and clearly brain damaged, right? But they were still responding to classical, to the earlier classical conditioning, right? So again, you take a rat, you classically condition it, and you start slicing through looking, can we disconnect this? Well, what this suggests is that learning and memory don't rely on a single connections across the cortex, that it's actually spread out and more complicated. Interestingly, it does seem now that Lashley's methodology was problematic because he looked all over the cortex, but not in another area that has not, has recently been kind of implicated in some of these more complex memory tasks, that being the cerebellum, right? This huge area in the brain, right, down here, where you see, you know, um, massive amount of neurons, right? So it's so associated with things like movement, we kind of like ignored, you know, balance uh, these other possible things. But what actually what did do that does make sense, because we see this in, you know, adults with brain injury, you have what's called equipotentiality and mass action. And the concept of equipotentiality means that everything in the cortex is kind of working together for the really complex behavior functions. So let's say, you know, your brain's just identifying, oh, there's a line here, like that earlier kind of vision stuff, fine, whatever. But when it comes to, you know, personality, complex behaviors, the whole cortex really is active, right? And the concept of mass action is uh, the more cortex you have working, the, the, the bigger this thing is, right? The more complicated it is, the, the more you have working, right? So the whole cortex is involved with the active potentiality, and the more of it, the better. Now let's look at some areas that we see associated, right? And I want to look at this. So this is called the striatum. It basically wraps around the, the thalamus and it's the primary input to the basal ganglia, right? And it's functioned uh, made up of what's called the caudate nucleus and the putamen. So there's going to be a lot of areas involved in memory. And these are not the traditional areas because we're talking about the basal ganglia, which is another area involved in memory but a different type of memory. And we're going to be going through these stories about memory, understanding memory, and the various areas involved. Here's some more, right? This, what we're looking at here is the entorhinal cortex. The entorhinal cortex is basically temporal lobe that's around the hippocampus. So you've got the hippocampus that's deep in the temporal lobe, right? Um, you know, functionally like kind of separate, but not really like very, very tied together. And you have these other areas like the amygdala, right? We already talked about that striatum, which we want to make sure we know what that is. But we should be pretty comfortable with these other areas and, and where they are and what they do, the left parietal cortex, prefrontal regions. And we consider what we call synaptic plasticity. So one of the things that's kind of like a hot topic in psychology is called mindset. And mindset is the idea of there's two types of mindset, which is fixed and growth. People with fixed mindset believe you know what you know and if you're not good at stuff, you can't be good at stuff. It's just, why bother? Growth mindset people are, we can learn anything. We can get better at stuff. Well, growth mindset is correct from a neurological standpoint because we have what's called synaptic plasticity, 
right? Which means our brains can change. Our brains can change. They adapt. Our hippocampus especially is extremely active in making new connections in order to store new memories. And so when we have talking about specifically what we think of as traditional memory, right? So traditional memory is I remember something. Well, this is the hippocampus heavily involved. And then we've got the prefrontal cortex. And so when we think about encoding, the prefrontal cortex is very much involved in taking these, you know, patterns of neural firing and turning them into something we can understand from a memory perspective, right? From a, you know, consciousness perspective. The hippocampus is involved, but heavily in what's called consolidation. When we take things and put them into long-term memory, we're consolidating, right? We're basically creating these new, con these new fairly permanent connections or connections that can be permanent so that this memory is there. With retrieval, various areas are involved. And we know this from studies of patients with brain injury and memory deficits. For instance, you lose your hippocampus, no new memories. That's it. Um, okay. So now we look at what we call where we see the engram. All right, so here is our um, cerebellum. And for classical conditioning, it appears that what Lashley was looking for is actually here. The problem is you start slicing and dicing through the cerebellum and you're gonna cause some major issues where you might not even be able to test that rat, right? And you have the area called the lateral interpositus nucleus, the LIP. And this is increased um, responses as learning happens, and it's necessary for learning and retention. So, again, it's correlational studies, but it seems very, you know, very clear that this is the case. And let me show you a little more. You've also got what's called the red nucleus. Um, and so, when you suppress activity um, in the LIP, the latter depositus nucleus, you have this. Uh, lack of learning. So basically, you could take a animal, you classically condition it um, while suppressing the LIP, and then the animal's not going to learn, right? So it's just not going to show any learning. Suppressing the red nucleus also causes this, but the LIP seems to be the last structure. Like basically, you need this to be functioning in order for learning to occur. If it's not functioning, learning not, is not going to occur. Now, we think about differences between learning and memory, and the early terms were short-term and long-term, and yet when we talk about like all the complexity of memory, we think about this is a fairly new concept. This is Hebb, and you know the, he gives the concept of like heavy and learning, and distinguish between short-term and long-term memory. And he was talking about, okay, stuff that's kind of like, you've got it, but it's not you know consolidated yet. And a lot of our myths about memory kind of come from early attempts to understand memory. And we'll look at some of those. And then, so now we think of short-term, this is a tough one because short-term memory is often used interchangeably in, in, in working memory. Sometimes we say, well, we don't really have, we don't call it short-term, we call it working memory. But they're not quite the same thing, right? So short-term memory is, if you were given a uh, series of numbers to remember, okay, like here's seven numbers, remember these numbers, and oh, by the way, while you're trying to remember these numbers, I'm going to distract you with these other tasks. In about 30 seconds, most of those seven, the information is gone, right? It's very difficult for this to happen. So you've got something special in the brain hap is, that's happening, it's storing the information on these numbers, and it just fizzles, just like the disappears fairly quickly. This is, so it's there, it's there temporarily, but your brain doesn't really do anything with it. Working memory is associated with this because if you put something into short-term memory, but you, what's called rehearse it, you basically say it over and over to yourself, it can stay there for a long time, even if it's irrelevant and doesn't really get into long-term memory. So working memory is kind of like, it's whatever you're thinking about, it's like what you're actively attending to. And if you're attending to this short-term storage, then that's what's happening. But there's more parts of working memory. 
Long-term memory is this idea of like kind of fairly stable and it's, it's in there. Now, Hebb gives us, gives us this rule, right? And it's when two neurons are active simultaneously, the synapse between them becomes strengthened. Sure, that makes sense, right? Because if you're having, forget humans, right? Think of a very you know, simple species with just a few neurons. If two neurons are firing, you know, maybe like a you know, few hundred or a few thousand neurons, and two of these neurons are really firing, when, the, when neuron A fires, B fires, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very high probability that B is gonna fire when A fires. It's gonna strengthen that synapse. Right, you want it to be more streamlined, you know, which means maybe producing more neurotransmitters, you know, maybe um, building more synapses in that area, you know, to increase the, the the strength of that connection between those two neurons. So you know, you got dendritic spines, you can you know branch off more um, you know axon and terminal button connections with these dendritic spines to increase the effect of neuron A on neuron B. And he talks about what's called long-term potentiation, which we'll get to as we kind of go through this, which leads to an increase in the number of receptors and neurotransmitters. So basically you've got this heavy synapse occurring when the cell is stimulated repeatedly, right? Basically the dendrite is repeatedly stimulated by an axon and it leads to this enhanced ability to become stimulated. So if you have the stimulation, and it's repeated, you're gonna increase the, the, the synapse strength. And if you recall, when we're talking about the brain itself, right, it's not, oh, the neurons fire or they don't, it's more, you know, that um, you have these neurons that are firing at a certain rate. So you increase the effectiveness and you're going to now be storing more information. Strengthening the synapse could mean something like when neuron A fires, neuron B, you know, is, is firing more, neuron B is firing more, right? Because it could be like that. So when we look at the differences between what we call working memory and long-term memory, working memory or short-term memory has a very limited capacity. Um, you, know, you think about how much can you really focus on at one time. Um, working memory fades very quickly if you're not rehearsing it. I mentioned it. If you can say something over and over in your mind, you can store it for a long time. If you can't, if that's interrupted somehow, you are going to lose it fairly quickly, right? Um, memories long from long-term memory can be stimulated, uh, but anything lost from working or short-term memory is gone. Working memory also can pull things out of long-term memory, right? So um, think of when you were learning to drive. You are now having to access information in long-term memory. You're pulling it into some kind of working verbal memory to, to think about it. Um, maybe it's a visual or something, and I'm asking you questions. So you have to kind of like go back to that memory and act on it. That's working memory accessing long-term memory. Long-term memory can be accessed, you know, not just with a cue, but scent. We know the power of certain smells that can bring back memories for us. Um, you know, so the idea is that everything enters short-term memory as part of working memory, and the brain consolidates into long-term memory if it's useful, right? If there's something there that we want to keep. So not all things that are in uh, working memory become long-term memories. You know, time needed for consolidation is going to vary often depending on maybe the semantic value. Recall Herman Ebbinghaus and his early work on memory and the forgetting curve. He used nonsense syllables. This stuff is hard, right? Because there's no meaning associated with it versus let's say you are, um, you know, think about memorizing lines for like an actor or an actress. This seems like a lot of information and it seems it can be very daunting for people who don't do this. Um, and yet when you have this as part of a story, right? And part of a role, um, there's meaning to it. It's not just like a bunch of random words. It's a story and you're able to kind of, you know, remember it in these kind of bigger, what we call chunks, and that can help this happen faster. We know that uh, epinephrine and cortisol enhance the consolidation of recent experiences, you know, so excitement, right? Adrenaline and stress are useful information. They basically tell you, hey, pay attention to this. It's probably important and you might need to remember it later. Well, the concept of working memory was proposed by
by Baddeley and Hitch as an alternative to the concept of short-term memory. Their emphasis was on temporary storage of information, right, that you attend to and work on it for a period of time. This gets us to remember, not just, oh, here's information, and if we rehearse it, practice it, we can put it in the long-term information, um, you know, long-term storage, but things like, hey, this is something that I'm pulling and working on, operating on. Let's say, you know, you're, you're uh, a designer, and you're trying to think of an object in your mind, and you're trying to, you know, you're manipulating it. It's a very visual kind of memory, not quite the same thing as, as short term. So this working memory contains a number of components, right? The visuospatial sketch pad for your, you know, kind of mental verbal stuff, your phonological loop for auditory information that you're thinking about. So there's a lot, number of, of, of components here. Um, the way you test short term memory is the delayed response task, and you want to pull working memory out of it. Right. So you test working memory by kind of quieting the working memory. You make that do something else and you stick stuff into short term memory like Ebbinghaus's here's 10 nonsense syllables. OK, you were going to say them, say them again. And now here's a bunch of math problems to distract you. Right. And then in 20 seconds, how much is there in 30 seconds? How much is there? So you can see the decay of this information in the short term store and that without working memory, what happens. So we understand that, you know, you know, research tells us that the prefrontal cortex is necessary for this kind of active function. And the brain may use elevated levels of calcium to what we call potentiate later responses. Well, if you want to cause some changes, we know that calcium is involved in long-term potentiation. And we also know that calcium has a double positive charge. So if you want to depolarize cells a little more, get some calcium in there depolarize the cells, they become more likely to fire, we're going to be storing and operating on information. Now, I think the best way to understand how memory works is to now take what we've learned and consider it from how we know these things, right? Amnesia. How does amnesia work? Well, we know that different things are involved, right, in different types of amnesia. And here's a fish that looks like that dory fish, right? That's supposed to, you know, have terrible, terrible memory. Um, dory seems to have, you know, functioning working memory, but as soon as, you know, she stops thinking about something, that information can decay. But she does show some learning, like she recognizes friends, you know? So there's interesting things happening here. It seems that Dory has maybe a suppressed ability to form memories, um, but it's still there. But Dory also shows like weird retrieval pro uh, uh, problems, right? It's really, it's really odd, you know, the, the, the cluster of behaviors that suggest more of a global uh, cognitive issues, and yet Dory seems to be able to solve problems. So again, how much do we trust movies and, you know, science? We'll look at some other examples of this shortly. So. We know that different areas of the hippocampus are active during memory formation and retrieval, uh, different areas of the brain are active, and so we understand how amnesia works. And there's one area of the hippocampus called the CA3, which is the major you know, thalamic connection, is like primarily necessary. So let's look at just broadly a bunch of areas in the brain and what they're associated with. So the hippocampus is associated with declarative and autobiographical memory, focusing on autobiographical, which is your experiences. And I'll tell you how we know this. Interrhinal cortex, right, temporal lobe area, around this information. The amygdala is associated with our emotional components of memory, right? Things that are scary or, you know, stimulate us emotionally, are going to be remembered pretty well. Um, the procedural memory is involved with the striatum and the basal ganglia. The left parietal cortex, we see the spatial memory, and then the prefrontal regions operating on working memory. So what movies do you know of that mess around with memory, right? Well, 50 First Dates, adorable, um, not even close. Right. I, I can't imagine a case where there has ever been a person who remembered everything throughout the day 
and then when we went to sleep, and then when they went to sleep, lost it. This is based on probably some script writer's very, very shallow understanding of how memory works. There was kind of like this, uh, students used to be taught that we need sleep for consolidation to happen, right? And that the reason we need to study or we need sleep to, to learn is that, and, and they should study right before bed because that's when all this consolidation is happening and things getting put in the long-term memory. No. So this is a myth having to do with memory, how we think memory works, but not how it actually works. Consider. When we uh, consider sleep, like and we've talked about sleep, what happens with, with memory? Well, we need sleep to actually get rid of stuff. Right. So sure, sleep is going to help us consolidate. It's going to help us kind of like replay and really encode, you know, re-encode strongly memories that matter to us. But for things that are irrelevant, we need sleep to clear it out. So one of the reasons that memory appears impaired after a lack of sleep isn't the that you've got all this stuff you need to consolidate. It's that you've got all this stuff that you need to get rid of. You need to sleep so that your brain can really identify these synapses, these, these, these new connections, these temporary memories that are not useful in the long term. In the same way, I can ask you, describe for me in detail what you did since you woke up today. You can do a pretty good job. You can do a really good job, maybe even describing some of the images from you know memories from your breakfast from your commute whatever it is that you've done today but when it comes to yesterday it's a little harder and if i were to ask you you know four days ago describe your day in detail really hard because the stuff from today you're forming these memories as you go along and you're just dumping them at the end of the day Right, because they're not they're not useful. So your brain needs sleep to get rid of these things. So that's how we end up with the 51st dates myth, right? Where you have a character who just cannot remember anything that happened during the day. Right. Next we have Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. This is a little bit, I don't know, it's a good try but it really oversimplifies synapses and how we store memories. It almost relies on the idea of like the grandmother cell um, where you've got this machine that's going in and zapping synapses and you've got somebody who's like watching the machine and making sure you just zap the right synapses where this memory is stored, right? The premise is uh, you have a bad experience and, and the characters are using it because of a bad, a bad breakup where they're very sad and they think that the best way to get better will be to remove this person from their mind. Right. So they never want to remember anything about this relationship. So they have people come in and while they're sleeping, they go in and they zap all memories of this person. All right. So let's pretend for a moment that we could actually look at your active memories in your brain. If you were to start zapping synapses like this, you would end up probably eating through a straw. Right. You're just going to wipe out way too much brain. It takes a while. It takes a while to get through stuff. It takes a while to work through things and memories will weaken over time, but then things will bring them back. And um, our memories also are a, a big part of who we are. And if we remove the bad experiences, as nice as it might seem sometimes, you know, to, to deal with those senses of loss and longing, it, it's going to change us, you know, in, in certainly in inexplicable ways. So we consider you know, that it's a cute idea. It's something that many of us might have thought of as a good idea, um, but it's not really how memory and synapses work. Um, the last one is a different take. So a Me Me Memento is a movie about a character that doesn't have any short-term memory, or I'm sorry, long-term memory at all. They, why am I saying this? They have short-term memory. They have working memory only. All right, so the character in Memento, the main character, only has working memory, um, which contains, you know, short-term, physiospatial sketch pad, you know, phonological loop, but they have no long-term memory. They have no ability to consolidate things into long-term memory, right? Which means that, you know, you leave the room, they meet you, you leave the room, they don't know who you are, right? Um, 
this one we'll talk about because it's based on a, a real person, right? And so, uh, and, and the way it's made is just fantastic. Like the filming of this movie, um, one of my favorite directors, it's really good. By the end of the movie, you feel like you have no short-term memory, like it's or no, long, no ability to consolidate into long-term memory. Uh, I'll say this right eventually. So here's how, how uh, it kind of works. So this is related to this character, this, this, this person named Henry Meliason, who was a real person who was studied by, for, for most of his life, by this uh, researcher, Susan Corkin. Um, and the debate is about what does the hippocampus do? And so there was a, a book that came, oh, okay, so when Henry Meliason died, his brain was donated to, um, um, re to, to research. And I believe some researchers in uh, San Diego got the brain and started to take slices and really high resolution images of the brain. All right. And they wanted to see, you know, okay, this is one of the most famous brains in science. This character, this, this person used to be called HM and was well studied. It's still in all the books, you know, you see it in, in every, you know, intro book, this person could not form new long-term memories, right? Like the memento character. Well, um, there were there was arguments when they started to look at the brain people said well there's actually some interesting damage here there's some stuff intact here that we thought wasn't you know when they really looked at it in depth and she took the brain back she was like no you can't have the brain anymore you, basically you're questioning my conclusions which is not good science i mean even with the questions people still generally accepted that what she did was correct i mean that she was right but there were also things that came out that she ignored data that didn't fit her conclusions about the hippocampus the idea is it's very complicated and there's a lot going on here and henry certainly had various you know things that were working and things that weren't so we look at um you know declarative you know in episodic memory um where things were intact and what henry could learn so let's look at kind of like what happened, right? So this debate about the hippocampus is really tied to the, you know, argument about did Dr. Corkin um, report everything correctly? And what does Henry Meliason's brain actually look like? Well, um, Henry was a, was a young man. He was, uh, you know, late 20s, early 30s when he had um, uh, this extreme, extreme surgery done where they, uh, Dr. Scoville was, uh, it has since been criticized for kind of like a, a very, um, you know, aggressive uh, type of surgery where it's like, let's just cut things out, you know. So, Meliason could not function. He had seizures that were so bad that, you know, as he went throughout his day, he would basically just drop and have seizures all throughout the day, every day. The long-term effects of this will be massive brain damage um, and, and an extremely shortened lifespan. So Scoville, when he starts cutting stuff out, we can kind of see where these things were removed. Huge portions of the medial temporal lobe were removed. And with it came the hippocampus, the amygdala, the entorhinal cortex, all these areas that seem to be extremely important in what we call explicit memories. So there's two main types of memory, explicit and implicit. Implicit is how to do things, you know, um, and the best way to think of the difference between explicit and implicit memory is typing on a keyboard, right? So explicit is what you know, implicit is how to do things. You can type on a keyboard really, really well, but if I were to say, okay, right now, get a piece of paper, don't look at the keyboard, get a key piece of paper and draw the keyboard, you'd be looking at it going, what? So like you're sitting there with your fingers over the keyboard and you're typing really well, but as soon as I ask you to draw this keyboard, this thing that you've seen many, many times, you're like, what? And this helps us to understand how bad our memories are. If I were to ask you, which way is Lincoln facing on the penny? Which way is Jefferson facing on the nickel? And are they facing you know, the same direction or different? Where does it say, in God we trust? Is it on the front or the back? Does it say e pluribus unum? Could you draw a penny or a nickel or a quarter from memory? It's like overwhelming. It's like, no, absolutely not. I have no idea what these things look like. I've seen them hundreds of thousands of times maybe in my life. 
you know, just, just, just glanced at these things. But it's not relevant, useful information. It doesn't get into, you know, our, our long term. So he seemed to, he seemed to have no problem with spatial memory, his ability to do, um, you know, procedural stuff. He could learn stuff. They did this task with him where they had him, um, you know, copy things. And um, so, for instance, they would have him uh, so in a, in a mirror drawing task. So basically, they you can't see your hand, but you can see the mirror of your hand and you're drawing. Right. But you can only see the mirror. Well, basically, it feels really weird because you're drawing backwards. It's like uh, if I'm on camera and my my video is not mirrored like, and you're watching yourself go the other way, it's like really weird. Like if you're, I don't know, when they first started doing these, uh, it happened to me where I'm, I'm trying to like center myself in the video and I almost fall off my chair because I, why am I going the wrong way? I'm going this way, right? So doing things in a mirror is really hard. Um, but he could learn this task. And so that was really interesting. These are called procedural memories, right? Basically you are, um, able to form these things. Procedural memory is related to our ability to type. You know how to do it or to use a telephone. Like where, where is the number seven on a keypad? You know, we were able to do these things, right? To drive. You don't think about what you're doing. You just do it, right? Sometimes people call this muscle memory. It's a bad term, but you get the general idea, right? So what we have was, is someone who could form new procedural memories, right? Could do uh, emotional conditioning, but couldn't learn new, well, no, couldn't do that, but couldn't learn new explicit memories because he didn't have these things. And if you don't have an amygdala, you can't do the emotional conditioning. So, but what did happen was he did seem to form a few um, new explicit memories. Like he didn't know who Elvis was before his surgery, right? But after years and years, he had an understanding. He recognized Elvis from just so much input. And so that's part of the debate, right? And the evidence that suggests to me that the hippocampus itself is really important in terms of our where we are when we're exper experiencing things. And I'll show you some other things that really give credence to this. And that it's these areas around the hippocampus that are associated with kind of these other types of, you know, information. And there's some other things that happen too um, that kind of help us to, to do this. So hippocampal damage is associated with anterior grade amnesia, right? Anterior grade amnesia is the term for the inability to form new memories. Retrograde amnesia is often due to head injury or psychological trauma. It's quite rare. Um, and there has been uh, very rare cases of this where there's actually been debate about whether, you know, this even really, this person had actual amnesia or was faking, right? There's actually, and then there was a, a very famous case where somebody wasn't treated because they thought they were faking because the, the physicians and the neuroscientists were like, no, this doesn't make sense. You, you, you can't have this type of amnesia. You can't just lose all of your memories. But it seems like it is possible even though rare anterior grade amnesia is more common uh it's easier to study and it's associated just with hippocampal damage so the hippocampus is generally associated with this idea of um i would say think of the the librarian in a library all right so it they used to have this thing called all right the card catalog where you'd have a card and you'd have it in this thing and if you wanted a book you would go look for it so a book comes into the library we can even think of the computer so the book comes into the library the librarian takes the book and types it into the computer and there boom now you know what shelf it's on and you can go get it the hippocampus is like the librarian right a book comes into the library there's no one to type it into the computer so the book is just tossed and you can never find it again it's gone right it's you know, oh we'll put it on this shelf here but how did it how do you get it you can't put it there if you don't have somebody to put it there and say, hey, this is here. So the idea is it's supposed to take this information, 
back to the cortex, process it, send it back for storage, and weave all these pieces into a single unified memory. Of course, you're going to have strong connections to the thalamus because an autobiographical memory involves sight and sound and smell and experience and emotion and memory. And all these things are, are associated with, with a, single, a single thing. So that's why we see this very strong connection here. I mentioned that he uh, HM could do implicit learning, right? Very common with patients with amnesia. And this explicit memory, the declarative memory, is this what we call deliberate recall of information that we recognize as a memory, right? And when we think of memory, this is what we think of. We don't necessarily think of this implicit memory, but the influence of recent experience and behavior without realizing we're using our memory. So, you know, a dancer, right, who's learning a series of steps, this is very procedural memory. They might be able to sit down and write down what the series of steps are, but it's very much embedded in the very doing, the very action itself of the memory. People with amnesia tend to show the normal working memory, right? They can still temporarily remember something. So it was, um, you know, you come into a room, you introduce yourself to Henry Meliason, you talk for a little while, you share some stories, you know, you tell a couple jokes, and then um, they would say, okay, I want you to remember this number. Think about this number. I'm going to come back in a little bit. I want you to tell me the number. And they would then leave the room. Uh, they'd come back in the room and say, hey, what, what number were you thinking of? You could say the number. And then he would introduce himself. So if he was thinking about something, he could remember that thing right, while it was active in working memory. But the person he met, gone from memory. That's the idea of the difficulty forming new declarative memories. Um, some retrograde amnesia, usually associated with the surgery itself, so you lose a couple weeks before the injury, better implicit than explicit memory, and nearly intact procedural memory, right, better implicit than explicit, right, and that's the idea of procedural memory. Um, research suggests that the hippocampus is necessary for functioning, especially in memory, episodic memory, important for spatial memory, and extremely important for this contextual learning and binding. How do we put things into context for learning? Now, we look at some of these other, other pieces where, you know, the, the idea of contextual learning, this is the detail and context of an event, right? So as we're learning, these things are important, right? Damage to the hippocampus impairs our recent learning more than our older learning, right? Um, and the more consolidated the memory becomes, the less dependent it is. You pull out the hippocampus or you temporarily put the hippocampus to sleep, you can still recall your memories. You just can't bring new ones. And it can take a while for a recent memory to really get kind of consolidated in the long term. We look at the basal ganglia because when we're talking about our implicit learning, our, you know, we're, this is where we're at. So we've got a corpus striatum, globus pallatus, substantia nigra, and subsalamic nucleus. Your major inputs are the patamen and caudate. So we looked at those, and here's these areas here. Basically, the basal ganglia is a functionally defined set of um, structures that are associated with uh, this dopamine system that can be part of memory. In turn, in, and even something like addiction, because it's a very fast kind of memory formation. And so we know that the hippocampus isn't responsible for everything because gradual learning can still take place. This kind of thing can happen. And um, we see really interesting things happen, for instance, with Parkinson's degree, disease. Um, people with severe Parkinson's are impaired in their ability to form new implicit memories, right? Almost uh, such a maybe a minor issue in regards to the you know symptoms of Parkinson's, but still definitely shows us the importance of our basal ganglia. Now we look at what's called the weather prediction task, right? And something that we kind of take for granted is we're aware of things, right? We're learning these associations that's part of procedural memory. So there's 14 cards. These are the cards in the deck. And they'll deal off uh, between one and three cards at a time. So there's, I'm sorry, four cards in the deck. They'll deal between one and three cards at a time. And this basically creates 14 possible combinations um, that the subject will use to predict the weather. So for every set of cards, 
they will be asked, is it going to rain? And the subject says yes or no. And the probability is never perfect. There's always some probability. So it's hard to learn because the probability might be, you know, you see a certain car, the probability is maybe 23% that it rains. So sometimes you'll say yes and you're right, but usually you're wrong. Some cards might have a higher probability, but not perfect. So maybe like an 80 something percent chance that it rains, but sometimes you're wrong. So because it's not a perfect predictor, you are kind of guessing, but not really. Like you're storing information on, okay, this card, maybe gave more information, this card gave less information, this combination made it very probable to rain or not rain or something like that. All right, so each card had a certain probability with it. In the same way that maybe, you know, temperature, cloud cover, things that we use, you know, on our own implicitly to kind of get an idea of the weather. I mean, you think about it, you walk outside in the morning, right, you get ready, maybe not paying attention to the weather, you walk outside, and you maybe go and say, okay, I'm, I'm overdressed or underdressed, or maybe I should grab an umbrella. These little things that kind of like kick in your head. And I, you know, um, you kind of think about these things, right? So in this task, you've got these different probabilities. And what you see is it requires both explicit and implicit memory. And they know this because people with hippocampal damage still learn, right? So if you have, you know, something like HM and you have anterior grade amnesia, you can still learn the weather prediction task, but you're slow. And you learn at the same speed that people with intact memory work if they're distracted when they're doing the task. And, you know, again, you distract people by having them do multiple tasks, interrupting them, you know. And so you see that you're using both of these types of memory. Now, there's different types of things that can cause amnesia. Um, one is called Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, and one is called, and we'll talk about Alzheimer's disease. So first we'll look at Korsakoff's and how this works. So Korsakoff's is caused by thiamine deficiency, right? So the people who are most likely to get Korsakoff's are heavy drinkers over a long period of time because alcohol blocks, you know, uh, B1 function and thiamine is necessary for uh, glucose metabolism. Can't use glucose, brain can't work brain can't work, cells start saying, well, I guess we don't need you. And so neurons start dying, right? So you get a shrinkage of neurons, you get fewer neurons, loss of synapses, and you see things like apathy, confusion, forgetting, what's called confabulation. Confabulation is a fantastic term in regards to memory. What happens in confabulation is somebody doesn't, can't explain why they did something. Right. Um, I've worked with people with brain injuries. It was very common. You'd ask them, you know, a, for something or for, for information, and they would tell you a story that wasn't true. They weren't like trying to lie, but they were trying to explain why they did something. Right. You might have experienced confabulation yourself. If you've ever gone to get something, walked into another room and forgotten what it was, you might have told yourself, something like oh i came to get this that wasn't actually what you came to get your brain was trying to fill in the blanks because it didn't know why you were doing what you were doing you can also see this in extreme cases of nutritional deficiency and i believe rare cases of eating disorders can actually see this too now here's alzheimer's and here's an alzheimer's brain and a functional brain you see just massive atrophy right? Lots of neurons dying. And, you know, again, function, you know, gets disrupted. It's uh, ex particularly damaging to declarative memory, often occurring with old age, and this gradual progressive loss of memory. So 50% of people over 85 and 5% of people 65 to 74 will show signs of Alzheimer's, you know, memory loss. Early onset seems to be genetic and uh, but most of the cases are late onset the earlier you get it the, the worse it is similar to like a lot of things uh, neurological diseases parkinson's huntington's the earlier you get it the harder it hits same with alzheimer's early onset alzheimer's is just devastating um about half of patients with late onset have no known relative it doesn't seem to be related to you know genetics now there's a couple components of alzheimer's you've got amyloid beta and um, tau, and you've got these um, plaque, basically plaques and tangles. So amyloid beta protein produces these this widespread 
uh, atrophy because it basically builds up into these clumps, right? And um, so these things will uh, will cause problematics, and you get these tangles where you, the tau disrupts the uh, structure of the microtubules, and you end up with axons that then break down and don't work, and so you can't send signals. So you basically end up with a bunch of dead tissue. And here's what uh, Alzheimer's in the brain looks like, and what you see this in as people age, this stuff builds up, right? You know, we, we know we need to do certain things for brain health, but age is just hard on the brain. The brain is not really good at getting rid of this stuff. And these plaques are going to get in the way of neural functioning. They're going to block synapses. They're going to interfere with neuron firing. Tangles are basically broken neurons. Here's your healthy neuron. And here's the buildup of these plaques and tangles in the brain. So these things revolt, result in neurofibrillary tangles, which are these helical filaments, uh, filaments within the neurons. Um, they assist with the cell transport and they disrupt the neuron structural matrix. It can't function. It can't, you know, send nutrients. It's just going to die. Uh, amyloid plaques are deposits that um, are part of a miscut protein, right? So you know how you've, you've got your... Um, ribosomes producing proteins well you cut it off but what happens is you cut it at the wrong point so you get a bad folding the wrong protein and can't really do anything and it's hard for the brain to get rid of now a young healthy brain is still going to have some of toxins build up but can get rid of them better but the more they build up the harder it becomes for the brain to get rid of these things and so you end up with these larger and larger deposits that eventually you can't get rid of. And we hear all these wonderful things like, oh, they're going to cure Alzheimer's. And there was this thing about ultrasound years ago. And where'd it go? Uh, anytime they say they're going to cure, I'm very, unfortunately, skeptical. Now, here's the thing. You look at an older brain, you're going to see these. You're going to see plaques and tangles. But you might not see symptoms of Alzheimer's. But as we age, these things build up. So it's a very complicated idea. Um, other areas, the amygdala is associated with fear learning. The parietal lobe is associated with piecing information together. And the anterior inferior region of the temporal lobe um, are associated with semantic memory. So again, this makes sense to us. And semantic dementia is loss of this memory, right? Especially if you have bilateral temporal damage. So with the amygdala, right? One of the reasons that I think HM seemed so pleasant and happy and, and handled things well is in addition to the hippocampal, uh, hippocampus is being gone, his amygdalas were gone too. Without the amygdala, we don't have that kind of emotional fear response. And so here's a guy, I mean, you think about it, you, let's say, have no more ability to form long-term memories. Your last memory is today. In 30 years, you look in the mirror and you remember it being today and you look 30 years older. That would be terrifying. Without an amygdala, you wouldn't necessarily have that, that fear. I'll look at some of these other areas here. We've got our prefrontal cortex, uh, where we see learning about rewards and punishments, um, specifically the orbitofrontal cortex, right, right above the eyes. Basal ganglia, ventral medial prefrontal uh, cortex, and orbitofrontal cortex all involved here. Um, if you have damage here, and this is where you see a lot of brain injury, especially in things like um, head injury, repeated concussions. Um, you know, we talk about like, you know, the danger of sports. You end up with people opting for the immediate reward, which is basically very impulsive behavior. So being successful and, and functioning well is often involved in your ability to say, I'll wait, you know, your ability to, you know, to behave in a controlled, disciplined way. People with damage here have certainly more difficulty with this. And what that means is um, you have, you know, more impulsive and dangerous behavior. If you consider, um, you know, the, the famous case of, of O.J. Simpson, um, it is very strongly believed that he has massive uh, CTE damage from, from all the hits he took to the brain and that he was, he's unable to control his, his, uh, his impulses. Um, we see activity in the brain resulting in physical changes, right? Back to mindset. We know that your brain is going to change as we learn. Um, patterns of activity leave a path, right? We can see them. 
uh, but not every change is a specific memory. These kind of broad things are happening. We know that the left posterior parietal cortex is uh, functioning in the storage of verbal material. Um, rehearsal was noted in Broca's area, part of the premotor cortex and part of the supplementary motor cortex. And spatial working memory in the right posterior parietal cortex um, is, is where we see that. This is all part of Smith's uh, PET, is, you know, a positron emission study, um, where they looked at where these things was happening. Now, this is really interesting, right? With explicit memory, children who have hippocampal damage, like severe hippocampal damage, but the rest of their temporal lobe is fine, they would go to school, they would learn new stuff, but they couldn't tell you what they experienced during the day. This goes back to what does the hippocampus actually do? And this is very strong evidence that the hippocampus is primarily associated with our autobiographical memory. So not all explicit stuff, but very much this. But here's the issue. With children, there's that plasticity. So a lot could be happening that might be related to their ability to function um, and kind of use something to adapt to this loss of the hippocampus. Now let's go back to the concept of, of long-term potentiation and, um, and how we know about these things. Now one of the things they use, um, when we talked about neurons, we talked about the squid giant axons, right, where you could actually see these huge neurons in the squid. Well here you've got the aplesia, which is this little sea slug that's also got very large neurons and not that many of them, so they're pretty easy to study. And they study things like habituation and sensitization. So how do you learn about things? So basically it's kind of like this. Habituation is this. If um, you know, you're trying to get some work done and someone keeps kind of like tapping you on the shoulder, just a little tap, tap, first be like what? And eventually they keep doing you like whatever. You just kind of like start ignoring it. You're not even really sensing it anymore. You're, you're wearing clothes, right? We've seen this example before in terms of our sensory receptors habituating to the idea that, oh yeah, I've I'm not feeling them. I maybe felt them when I put them on, but I habituated. Sensitization is when things make you more sensitive to certain things. Um, we see, for instance, um, in amygdala responses, right? You can sensitize the amygdala. If we were to um, upset you, right, you'd be more likely to get, to get upset again. So think about like uh, you're driving and um, you're just kind of minding your own business, so everything's fine. Somebody cuts you off and flips you off, and you're like, whoa, not only were you at fault, you also blamed me. You know what I mean? Like, that's messed up. So you're like getting really annoyed, and then somebody is driving slow and in front of you now, and a little while later, and then normally wouldn't upset you, but now you're just kind of like pissed off in general. Like, sensitization leads to that. Well, the study of these things is really useful there. Right. So we talk, you know, habituation is a decrease in response to a stimulus that's presented repeatedly and accompanied by no change in other stimuli. And so there's going to be a temporary, uh, you know, these are temporary changes between the neurons. And then our, you know, sensitization is increase in response. And we see serotonin released, um, potassium, you know, blocks potassium channels and the presynaptic neurons. So you see these things happening. And then that means that you're going to be more likely to have depolarization, you know, sensitization. Well, with long-term potentiation, right, back to, you know, our, uh, our HEB stuff, right, um, you actually can see these changes, and this is what happens, right? So neurons, the, the, ter the way that it was described is neurons that fire together, wire together. It's not a great, you know, we don't, it's not wires, but the more they fire, the stronger they connect, right? So sometimes it helps to think of it that way. Right, so you leave the synapse potentiated for a period of time, and the neuron's more responsive. Right, so you get the more inputs, the more. So you, you maybe you've got a neuron; it's getting like thousands of inputs. If a bunch of these are working together, like all firing at the same time, you get a strong potentiation response. And we know that glutamate is heavily involved in stimulating these receptors, leading to this long-term potentiation. And that brings us to the end. So we've gone through quite a bit in regards to, you know, different types of memory and where they are in the brain and understanding kind of some of these memory myths and how memory actually works. 
I hope that you've enjoyed our discussion today, and I look forward to future discussions uh, with you in our physiological psychology uh, topics. Thank you.